the second uh, debate. If you uh, just join us, uh, make sure you have a clicker from the box there. You will need it to vote at the end of the debate. Um, and I will briefly give you the instructions before we vote at the end. Uh, again, please join us. Okay. Uh, great. So for those of you who came in, I'll just uh, briefly reintroduce the speaker. So to my far right is Professor Craig Nard from Case Western. Uh, to his left, Professor Mark Janis from IU Bloomington. To my immediate left is Professor Kathy Strandberg from NYU. And to my far left, Professor Timothy Holbrook from Emory. So uh, now we're going to, uh, I guess, second. It's going in and out. So, so the second proposition is uh, we should eliminate the best mode and written description requirements and rely on enablement as the sole uh, 112 paragraph and one disclosure requirement. Among other things, a vigorous enablement requirement could lead to the development of more coherent patentability guidelines. So just uh, to remind some of you, uh, Disclosure is a statutory requirement in patent law, so I put up the relevant statutory provision, and you'll notice that written description, best mode, and enablement are actually in the text of 112 paragraph 1. And, and so briefly, uh, enablement basically seeks to put uh, well, requires that the disclosure enable a person of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the full scope of the claimed invention at the time of filing, the written description requirement. Uh, the disclosure is viewed as evidence of what the inventor invented as of the filing date. So the question is, at the time of filing, would the description convey to a person having ordinary skill in the art that the applicant had possession of the invention? And finally, the best mode requirement, what did the applicant believe to be the best mode of practicing um, the invention, if any, at the time of filing? So we will start with the uh, uh, four side. So I'll start with Professor Nord. OK, I'll go first again here. Um, yes. Two points. Um, the first point, and I, you could begin with the statute. And I think it, you know, it's a cumbersome statute, as Judge Rader said in his uh, partial dissent in Ariad. Um, but I think the proper reading is that just because written description, those words are in the statute, doesn't mean there's a requirement that flows therefrom. I think if you read it properly, um, there is an enablement requirement that, that describing the invention feeds into. But I'm just going to put that to the side and focus on a few other things. The first question is, what does written description give us that enablement does not? And I don't think it gives us very much. I think at best, it's superfluous. Uh, at, at worst, it's confusing. Enablement is about commensurability. You, as a patentee, are entitled, in terms of your property right, based on what you disclose. Okay. Enablement does a very nice job of measuring that with a test called undue experimentation, as many of you know. Is what is disclosed, does what is disclosed enable a person of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the claimed invention without undue experimentation? It's an objective standard. A person of skill in the art could read a specification and come away with a pretty good idea of either yes or no. Written description, on the other hand, which also seeks to get at commensurability, asks the question, can a person of ordinary skill in the art read the specification and determine that the inventor was in possession? of the claimed invention. Sometimes the court will say, can a Fosita, ordinary artisan, visualize and recognize that the patentee was in possession? I don't know what that means. Um, and I don't, I, and I, I'm confident in saying that I don't know how many skilled artisans would understand that as well. And here, in a property rights regime, certainty is exceedingly important. Uh, we want our persons of ordinary skill in the art to be able to read the specification and understand whether there's an enabling disclosure there, and therefore understand where the proprietary rights of the patentee reside, so our improvers can either build upon it, design around it, so forth. Second point, what does written description give us that section 112, paragraph 2, the clear claiming or definiteness requirement, uh, does not give us? Again, I don't think it does much. In some ways, the written description requirement, it's lingering here, is really a relic of a bygone era before clear claiming was required. 
So section 112.2 requires patentees to claim with particularity what their invention is. Let me just read from Ariad very quickly. Claims principal function is to provide notice of the boundaries of the right to exclude and to define limits. It is not to describe the invention. Really? Although their original language contributes to the description and in certain cases satisfies it, claims define and circumscribe the written description discloses and teaches. Well, I thought enablement discloses and teaches. So I think the two, that the enablement and clear claiming requirements more than satisfy what written description seeks to do. Lastly, I will say, if we are concerned about the patentee getting more than what he's entitled to, the hypothetical was given that I claim A, but the specification enables A, B, and C, well, just because it enables B and C doesn't mean you should get B and C. There's something called the public dedication rule. There are all sorts of tools of claim construction that can limit claim scope accordingly. Thank you. Uh, Professor Holbrook. by saying that the views I'm about to express do not represent the views of Emory Law School nor necessarily Professor <laughs> Timothy Holbrook before I am impeached. I am impeached by my co-author on an amicus brief in area. That being said, um, I think what these doctrines are about, particularly best mode and written description, are forcing information disclosure. Uh, and as between the, the public and the patent applicant, the applicant is in the best position to know about her creation, what it entails, the scope of it. Uh, and so at, during the patent application process, there are incentives for applicants to behave strategically. They may want to keep back some information and maintain it as a trade secret or some sort of know-how that they don't disclose. That way they can maintain their competitive edge when they're actually on the market. Now in the contract context, when one party has more information than another and there's an information asymmetry and incentives to act strategically, uh, some have articulated the idea of creating penalty default rules, where if you fail to disclose sufficiently that information, you will be penalized. I think that's what the Federal Circuit is doing. It's creating a penalty default rule that says if you want patent protection and you don't want to forfeit that claim, you better put it in the patent document. Be robust in your disclosure. You can't simply fall back on the fuzzy knowledge of one of ordinary skill in the art, which is enablement, uh, and say, well, that's, as long as the FOSITA knows what I'm talking about, that's enough. We need to see it in the patent document. If you want broader protection, memorialize it. Put it in the document. Tell us what your invention actually is. If you fail to do so and you want to play that game and act strategically, uh, then you run the risk of simply losing that patent claim and that protection. And so it's starting to incentivize that form of disclosure. And so in response a bit uh, to Professor Nard, the idea is that we want the patent document to be supreme. We don't want to have to rely on this extrinsic fuzziness. If I read the patent document, I should have a clear idea of what your invention is and allow me to design around it, even without having to be concerned about this idea of undue experimentation. Uh, moreover, it still is relevant even beyond that initial disclosure idea in policing against adding new material into a patent application as it goes through the process. Uh, that seems to be a rather the uncontroversial side of this debate, uh, and I do think it can still serve a very important function in that regard. Professor remarks are right on point. They're just wrong. And he knows it, but he's a good advocate. Um, I, I like the way that this proposition is phrased because it does press us to think normatively about this issue, and, and in the courts, this issue has kind of stagnated. The debate has kind of stagnated, so it really is it's good to look forward as this proposition asks us to do. So enablement is good. Written description is bad. Even if you draw all inferences in favor of it, it's bad. Best mode should be just gently put out to pasture. Um, why is enablement good? Uh, Craig has covered that uh, ably. Um, enablement uh, best expresses the teaching function of the patent document. It's the historic requirement. It, it, it's, it's close to the very meaning, why, uh, the, the very meaning of the, the term letters patent, the phrase letters patent, open letters, uh, because these, there's a transparency in the document, and that's uh, effectuated by enablement. Courts have had decades to refine that and have done a pretty good job of it. Now, uh, what if we assumed arguendo 
in favor of all the arguments that you can make in favor of the written description requirement. So set aside the fact that you have to engage in a tortured statutory construction to get a, a written description requirement in the current statute. Set aside the fact that really smart, experienced judges who have tried to craft a standard for the written description requirement haven't been able to do so coherently. Set aside the fact that everybody agrees that virtually all of the cases that create concerns about adequacy of disclosure can be dealt with by the enablement requirement. Virtually all, not all, but virtually all, uh, along with the, new, the prohibition against introducing new matter, which already exists in the statute. Assume away all of that stuff, what is left in this very small sliver of cases where we still have qualms? What are the qualms really? I think that the qualms really are qualms about evidence qualms about uh, a fear that the, the patent applicant hasn't adequately proven that they completed the invention. And you can see this fact pattern in some of the cases that give rise to a written description requirement. That's an evidentiary issue. That is not an adequacy of disclosure issue. Did someone say 30 seconds there? Okay. Uh, it's not an adequacy of disclosure issue. We shouldn't fetishize the specification as the sole evidence that you completed an invention. We don't do that in other areas when we're thinking about uh, proving a time of invention. We shouldn't do it with respect to an adequacy of disclosure doctrine. That's why Tim's arguments are exactly on point. Uh, it really is about evidence. It's just that the written description cases come out exactly the wrong way by making it into an adequacy of disclosure doctrine. Uh, Professor Strandberg. Okay, so uh, I just want to follow on um, about uh, what Professor Holbrook already said um, to, um, to point out that it's, well, and, and responding a little bit to the people on the other side, that while there often is an overlap between a disclosing how to make and use something and describing the invention, um, these are just not the same thing. And what the written description requirement is intended to do is something that's pretty important in patent law, which is to help to ensure that a patentee who's going to get exclusive rights gets them only over those things that she actually invented. And often, uh, one can tell that by the fact that someone can make an enabling disclosure of how to make and use the invention, but not always. So invention, for example, sometimes comes in recognizing a problem or simply seeing that something provides a solution to a problem. Um, it might be that once the problem is recognized, the patentee's specification enables those in the field to make and use the solution, but the patentee did not come up with the solution. So why should we bear the social cost of exclusive rights? And one of the kinds of cases that provide an example of this, just quoting actually from the court's area decision, um, is uh, our chemical cases where we're talking about generic uh, genuses of chemicals. So the court says, um, uh, although written description and enablement often rise and fall together, requiring a written description plays a vital role in curtailing claims that do not require undue experimentation, but that have not been invented. Now, of course, you might say, well, that's what the claims are for, right? We have the claims for that. Um, but the requirement of a written description helps to cabin overly aggressive assertions of claim scope. And this is important in part because claim interpretation is so difficult and so unpredictable. In hindsight, patentees often, maybe even almost always, want to argue for a claim interpretation that's broader than what they actually invented and had in mind at the time. So the written description requirement is one tool that helps to preclude this. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to have two doctrines that help to cabin claim, slow, claim scope and avoid overly early patenting. And this is for exactly the reason that Professor Holbrook already mentioned, because it's not so bad to put the burden on the patentee, who is actually, after all, the one who knows what the invention is and is asking for exclusive rights to describe it clearly. Now, I also just wanted to make a, um, because best mode has been kind of um, ignored here, so I just want to also make a very 30-second pitch um, for the best mode requirement. Um, the best mode requirement um, disincentivize, disincentivizes patentees from hiding tacit knowledge that they have, that they have obtained from what they've already done about how best to use the invention. And enablement permits a lot of experimentation. The argument in favor of best mode is simply that if we're going to give someone exclusive rights, um, 
We simply no need to have everybody else out there redoing the same experimentation that the patentee has already done in order to get information that the patentee already has and might be conveying to the public in exchange for the exclusive rights. Okay, so would any of the speakers like to respond? Uh, just a couple of quick points in, in the one minute. And any, any fuzziness that would uh, elude enablement should be captured by the claims. Um, part of the problem with the Federal Circuit's definiteness jurisprudence is that nothing is really ambiguous these days. If the Federal Circuit were serious about tackling the fuzziness that Professor Holbrook talks about, then you have to put some teeth into the definiteness requirement. That's what it's for, not written description. The other thing I would make is that what about after arising technologies that a patentee is supposedly able to capture? Technologies that did not exist at the time of filing, um, yet may be enabled, but certainly would not be described in the written description as interpreted by the Federal Circuit. Uh, what happens to, to that part of the property right? The other thing is the harsh sanction. With enablement and claim construction, claim construction working hand in hand, you could simply say to the patentee, you put in a lot of work, I get that, you're just not entitled to this, but over here, it's, it, you're still valid. With written description, everything's gone. I'll say one final thing about best mode, and that is, um, I don't even know why we have this. Uh, it's, it's, it's permissive in, in trips. A lot of countries don't have it. The reason I have problems with it is that you just can't enforce it. There's no duty to update after filing. Um, everyone knows that patent attorneys play games with it. You could, um, it's, the inventor has to have the best mode. The inventor could invent, then send him away on a vacation and have your little best mode team there uh, working on best mode. So it's, it's a requirement that has good intentions, but I think just doesn't work in practice. Respond a little bit. Um, I actually I'll just respond specifically to, to those points. Um, the first one is to after arising technology. Um, clearly, what to do about after arising technology is a big problem in patent law. It pervades lots of our doctrines in patent law. Um, I don't think it's a particular problem for written description any more than it is for many other doctrines, including enablement. Right? You, it's impossible to enable after arising technology as well. So that's just a problem. We have to draw some lines in deciding that. Yeah, when you claimed the fastener, you get the new fastener that was invented, but you don't get some other new thing that was invented. It's a hard problem, but it's not a written description problem. Um, secondly, as far as the, um, uh, the, the sort of, uh, uh, that th this is an all or nothing thing, um, in fact, it's really not an all or nothing thing. And the reason for that is that patentees put in not just broad claims, but also narrower claims. They put in dependent, cla dependent claims off of their independent claims. Um, because they know what they actually really invented and they want to make sure they get that in their claims. Um, and so I think that the, the types of claims that are a problem from a written description point of view are those very broad claims. And it's extremely rare that a patentee would have only those kind of claims in their patent. They'll have dependent claims. They're not going to be left defenseless. Yes. Well, Kathy makes a great point uh, about redundancy in adequacy of disclosure requirements. In the abstract, it's a very reasonable proposition to say this is really important value in the patent system, so why not have requirements that, if they're a little redundant, what's the big deal? Well, you know, there is a big deal, of course, and particularly because the written description uh, jurisprudence is so vacuous, uh, and that is that uh, it retards the evolution of other doctrines. So it, it potentially is bad if cases that would be refining the enablement doctrine uh, instead are a little bit of smoke and mirrors written description cases. Yeah, I think it also infects the court's claim construction jurisprudence as well. Uh, and these are other tools that Craig has talked about already as more refined tools for uh, making sure that claim scope uh, correlates to disclosure. On the best mode, I'll just pile on here, I think. Uh, it's an anachronism. It speaks in terms of mode. There is really no correlation between the concept of mode and the current claiming structures. And as Craig mentioned, it's, it's a matter of, of a subjective threshold test. So you really don't have assurance objectively uh, that you're getting disclosure that we would even care about anyway. Uh, it's all subject, and, and any kind of a subjective test we ought to look askance at, usually, anyway. Um, 
In defense of best mode, uh, I think it does, if we were worried about the strategic behavior on the part of applicants to hold back information, uh, then best mode can act in a way to make sure that there is that added incentive to disclose more robustly. Uh, that feeds into the evidentiary point uh, that uh, Professor Janice brought up about, well, this is just a question of evidence. Yes, and so why don't we memorialize that evidence in the patent document? That should make life more efficient. It should reduce levels of litigation, hopefully, if you can consult the patent document and not have to have the higher gun battle of the experts, which is what would arise under enablement. If I can see it in the patent disclosure and know, based off of the examples listed, what did you actually create, uh, that should make things clearer. Uh, with respect to the, the issue of after rising technology, I think, in fact, uh, that that issue supports the written disclosure obligations in that um, if you want to claim broadly, you need to give some adequate support for it. Uh, and if you are narrowly tailored to your particular claims, you have resort to the doctrine of equivalence to ensnare the after rising technology that should not be dealing with the literal infringement and the literal scope. Now, the doctrine of equivalence is in a set, sorry state, but that's a different issue, and right, I'm, I'm free to disagree with what the Federal Circuit has done there and say that their doctrine of equivalence jurisprudence is a mess, uh, but I don't think that that necessarily tells us that the written description is an improper tool uh, for combating claim scope, at least with respect to the literal scope of the claim. Okay, let me open up the floor. Uh, does anyone have a question for the uh, panel? Okay. That convinced one of us here was that convincing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's true. I'm looking. I'm looking so we have uh, we have time for the uh, speakers to give a one minute uh, wrap up if they care to. So, uh, Professor Nord. Wow. Um, you know, we didn't talk a lot about the statutory text. Just let me say a few things about that. Um, you know, the, the, the text itself says the specification shall contain a written description of the invention, comma, and of the manner and process of making and using it, comma, and goes on to say as to enable. I think a fair reading of that, uh, as, as Mark said, a reading is not tortured, would suggest that there's no written description requirement. Uh, the words are there, but they're there because you have to describe the invention so that you can show that you have enabled it. I don't see where you glean a written description requirement uh, from simply the statutory text. So I thought I would just throw the text on the table. Uh, Professor Holbrook. I think the text is, again, at best ambiguous, but if you look at that comma, right, that may suggest that it is something that is in addition to the manner of making and using is the description of the invention itself, which is distinct then from the claiming requirement of paragraph two, which again suggests that there's an added burden to actually tell us what the invention is. Uh, in some sort of level detail. Now, maybe it's an anachronism from a, pre, uh, a regime before there were claims, uh, but that still exists as a matter of helping us understand what the inventor actually created. Um, and so I think this, the statutory language actually more naturally supports uh, a requirement for some additional disclosure in it beyond simply an enablement uh, of how to, uh, enabling disclosure of how to make and use. And I had another point, and I just went out of my head. So I will stop there. Professor Janice. Back to evidence. If, if Tim's, I'm going to keep pushing this because why not? If Tim's right about uh, the document being the critical, uh, you know, methodology, the critical point of evidence, um, then we we really shouldn't have an enablement. We shouldn't tolerate that requirement either because by that requirement you don't have to explicitly disclose everything. We do rely on the person of ordinary skill to fill in information there and have for pretty much since we've had patent systems. So um, the reason for that, of course, is cost. Uh, it's costly to foresee everything that you would need to disclose later. Certainly that's true under a regime that requires a fuzzy a written description requirement. Um, and that's why, as an evidentiary matter, certainly the patent document is the first place you would look but we shouldn't hold that up as the lone place one would look in proving whether an invention occurred. Professor Strandberg. Yeah, just, just quickly. Um, I, I think it's important to emphasize the um, salutary effects of having um, two doctrines with which to, um, basically, we're, we're talking about policing patentee strategic behavior. That's, I think, what this is mostly about. And sometimes um, it is, better or easier 
to make one, one argument, the written description argument, rather than the enablement argument um, than the other, even if one could make both arguments, um, partly for the evidentiary reasons of talking about the written description requirements more focused on what's in the document. And when that argument can be made, then I think why not uh, have that argument available to be made. The other point is about having the person having ordinary in the skill, skill in the art fill in. We, are, we, we cannot avoid having that happen with patents because otherwise it's just impossible for you know, people to read them. Um, on the other hand, what the written description requirement allows us to avoid is having the patentee be lucky enough to have the person having ordinary skill in the art out there, and of course this is in hindsight, usually during litigation, fill in things that the patentee didn't actually invent. So this is what the written description requirement is really about. Okay, so it's time to vote, and I will let Professor J Gervais explain to you the process. Okay, so for those of you who uh, joined us late, uh, make sure you have a clicker from the box. I saw a couple people come in who did not get one. Give you a chance to pick up the clicker. Okay, international standards of patentability. <laughs> 